more of my background. I worked for Apple from 83 to 87. My job was to evangelize developers to create Mac software. I left Apple, I, I started a Mac software company. I returned to Apple a few years later as Apple's uh, fellow and chief evangelist. I left that to start a venture capital uh, firm. And now I am the chief evangelist of a company out of Sydney, Australia called Canva. Uh, it's an online graphics design firm. I'm Mercedes-Benz brand ambassador. So if you want to see one of the few AMG GTCs, which is the convertible version of the AMG GT, it, it's out there. Uh, it may be one of five or so in the United States. It's a long story how I got it. You don't want to know how. And uh, I'm also on the faculty as a, an executive fellow of uh, the School of Business at UC Berkeley. It's called Haas, H-A-A-S. So that's what I do right now. And I'm also the author of 13 books. I'm working on my 14th. Uh, so I've been, I've been a, a worker for a large company like Apple. I've started companies. I've been a venture capitalist. Uh, I'm an advisor. I'm, I'm just got, I'm old. I've done a lot in my life. Uh, so I, I wanted to pass on some 10 key points that I've come up with uh, scaling, and uh, we'll have a discussion. So uh, I hope you don't, <laughs> I hope none of this shakes you up because I'm not known for pulling any punches, okay? <laughs> so uh, some thoughts on the art of scaling. So number one thought that I have is I have never seen a company really fail because it could not scale fast enough, honestly. I think many entrepreneurs they have this fear that, oh my God, you know, we're going to have so many customers and so many people are going to be buying our dog food and so many people are going to sign up that we can't scale. So we, you know, we need to put everything in the cloud and you know, co-location and we build up this infrastructure and all this kind of stuff. And come to find out, maybe it's not a hockey stick. Maybe there's a bump in the, in the road and lots of companies, um, they run out of cash in that chasm. Uh, the work of Jeffrey Moore, Crossing the Chasm, a very interesting book for you to read. And so I, I'm urging caution that I think it's better that you go slow and maybe sacrifice some growth than to go too fast and die. Because one outcome is very bad, death. The other outcome of sacrificing some growth is not so bad. And I, I, I urge you to be conservative. Um, don't just think it's like a hockey stick to infinity and beyond. There are going to be bumps in the road. And so, you know, you, you by definition, the, the leading cause of failure in tech companies is death. So as long as you have money in the bank, you're not dead. You're still in the game. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so that's tip number one for you. Tip number two is uh, I think when people start to scale and, and grow, they forget that they need to hire people who complement them, not overlap with them and not duplicate with them. So if you're the engineer, don't hire just only engineers. You need people who are in operations, sales, finance, all the other stuff that you don't want to do and you cannot do probably. And the first part of this is at the Macintosh division, we had this theory that A players hire A plus players. So if you're a really good person, you'd hire a person better than you because you have a self-confidence and you're not worried about someone looking better than you. So if you're the CEO, theoretically, your CFO should be better at finance than you, your CMO should be better at marketing than you, your CTO should be better at tech than you. So it should be a source of pride that everybody in the room is better than you. Because I think that A players hire A plus players. On the other hand, B players, hire C players, and C players, hire D players, and D players, hire E players, and you wake up one day and you're surrounded by Z players, and this is what we call in Silicon Valley the bozo explosion. So you need to fight the bozo explosion. Third point is at some point you have to put in systems. It cannot be totally ad hoc. Uh, this is, I think, one of, this is a major philosophical shift that you can't just fly uh, by the seat of your pants anymore. And this is, this is a major mind shift. It takes a different kind of person. You know, there are people who, to use a programming example, there are people who are just great at creating version one, but that doesn't mean that they're great at debugging and creating version 1.1. 1 
So you need all kinds of different roles. And I think it's a very a big re a realization that you hire people like that, and then you have to put in systems for people like that because they have a different operating system. Uh, it took me a long time to figure this out. Uh, number three, uh, going back to Jeffrey Moore. So, you know, I, I think entrepreneurs have this temptation that they look at success stories, Google, Apple, Microsoft, whatever, right? So let's take the case of Microsoft. So you look at Microsoft and you say, my God, total world domination. Operating system, right? Applications, cloud, enterprise, gaming. They got everything. And so you're two guys in a garage, two gals in a garage, a guy and a gal in a garage. Maybe you're 15, maybe you're 25, maybe you're 50 employees. But you're looking at the Microsofts and the Googles and the Apples and you say, wow, they have system, they have app, they have cloud, they have e-commerce, they have content, they have everything. So if we're going to be like them, we have to think big. And I suggest to you that the way those companies got big is they did one thing really well, and then they serially went down the line. So, you know, Microsoft started with operating system, and then they do apps, and then they do, you know, and they go down the line, and then one day you wake up and you say, my God, we have achieved worldwide domination. But I don't think it's because Gates and Balmer, you know, 30 years ago sat down and said, okay, we're going to do operating system, apps, online, e-commerce, content all at once, and then we're going to wake up and we're going to own the world. So the analogy is don't go for the strike in bowling. Hit one pin down at a time. This is also a theory from Jeffrey Moore. You hit one pin down, you hit another pin down, you hit another pin down, and then one day you wake up and my God, all the pins are down. And that's worldwide domination. Next thing is, I think you need to pick your few battles that, you know, what's the core competitive advantage of your company? Is it technology? Is it marketing? Is it your geographic location? Is it your cost center? Whatever it is, and I would urge you to not try to fight too many battles. Like, you know, don't try to say, okay, so we're going to have the best technology with the best customer support. We're going to have 24 by 7. We're going to be in every geographic market. We're going to be localized for every language. We're going to do all that stuff. And by the way, we're going to invent a new business model. You know, you can buy software, you can rent software, you can lease software, but we figured out a new way to distribute software. So, you know, it's hard enough to make great software. It's hard enough to sell great software. It's hard enough to support great software. But if you think you're going to innovate in all areas, wow, that is, that is a big, hairy thing. Um, I think you should just pick your battles. Pick the battle that's going to be most important for you. And so what if you don't have, you know, a Nobel Prize winning business model? If you could just make stuff for a buck and sell it for five, I'm telling you, man, that business model works all day long, okay? <laughs> number six. Number six is let a hundred flowers blossom. This I stole from Chairman Mao. And by this I mean you probably have a very good idea of who you think your customer is. And you are fairly mature, so you may have, in fact, really picked the right customer. But I think that even through the life of a company, even as you know, something like Apple or Microsoft or any of these companies, at some point you ship, you take your best shot at positioning and branding, and then you see what happens. And many times I think you'll be surprised that people who are not your intended customer buy your product or service, and they use it in unintended ways. So with the Macintosh, we thought we had a spreadsheet database and word processing machine, and we were zero for three there. So what saved Apple was desktop publishing, but we did not plan desktop publishing. We didn't know anything about desktop publishing. Luckily, all this PageMaker from Seattle, you know, with Adobe making PostScript, so all this PageMaker with PostScript and a laser printer created desktop publishing. That was not designed by Apple, and that's what stuck. So we were focused on making Macintosh, a Fortune 500 MIS sale, spreadsheet, database, order processing, come to find out what really blossomed was desktop publishing. Newsletters, books, newspapers, PowerPoint slides, that kind of stuff. So I learned a very valuable lesson, which is you take your best shot, but then you put it out, 
And if flowers blossom in unanticipated places with unanticipated people, declare victory and take the money. <laughs> take the money. To use a more analog example, you know, Avon is this cosmetics company. And they have a product called Skin So Soft. And the purpose of Skin So Soft, you don't have to be a genius to figure out, is to make your skin soft. So women are supposed to buy Skin So Soft to make their skin beautiful, OK? But what they were buying it for was as an insect repellent for children. <laughs> so you know, what do you do? Do you say, oh my god, we, you know, we need to call in McKinsey, and we need to like, figure out how we can get women to buy Skin So Soft to make themselves beautiful? I think not. I think you declare victory. You say, hallelujah, you know, this is absolutely what we intended. We wanted to create a great insect repellent that's good for your kids. You know, our positioning statement now is safer and kinder and gentler than DDT for your children. You know? <laughs> and then now we, have, we put in sunblock inside of our skin so soft. So we block the sun and the insects for your children. Take the money. Take the money. You know? You want to repel insects? You want to do desktop publishing? Hallelujah. I, I don't know if you're that familiar with how Silicon Valley works, but let me give you an insight. The way it works is we throw a lot of stuff against the wall. Very few things stick. We go up to the wall. We paint the bullseye around what's stuck, and we say, we hit the bullseye. <laughs> That's why a venture capitalist has never made a bad investment, because they always put the target on the board after you see what sticks. Now, you say, well, guy, you know, there's a lot of failure. 90% of the companies fail or whatever. So if you ever get a venture capitalist, to be honest, you say, well, you know, let's, let's say you go to Kleiner Perkins or Sequoia, right? And, and you say, well, why'd you invest in Cisco? And you say, well, we knew that with the internet, people would need hardware, blah, blah, blah. Why'd you invest in YouTube? Well, we knew that people would upload video and we're going to democratize video and, and then, Why'd you invest in you know, Yahoo? Well, we knew that people wanted content. That was you know, a, a killing proposition for that, for the internet. And they say, well, why'd you invest in Webvan? Why'd you put $400 million so that people could buy you know, dog food online? Why'd you lose so much money? I mean, you did Apple, Cisco, Yahoo, YouTube. Why'd you do Webvan? And that venture capitalist will say, I told my partners not to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's how it works, OK? <laughs> Number seven, let me explain the difference between being a baker and an eater. If you want to scale, I think you need to think like a baker. An eater sees the world as a zero-sum game. If you eat the pie, I don't eat the pie. The more you eat of the pie, the less I eat of the pie. A baker, a baker sees the world as not a zero-sum game. I can bake more pies, I can bake bigger pies, I can bake cookies, I can bake cakes. Everybody can get dessert. And I would say that if you are an innovative company, you should be thinking like a baker, not an eater. That you're not trying to prevent your competition from succeeding. You're trying to legitimize the entire industry. And if you legitimize the entire industry, then the rising tide floats all boats. You can save this battle when you get 90% market share later. Right now, the battle is to legitimize the industry. You need to make the, the entire ocean float higher. Worry about getting your specific part of that ocean later, OK? So think like a baker, not an eater. Number eight, oh, I repeated myself, my god. Number nine is focus on sales. And uh, my observation has been, working with venture capitalists and entrepreneurs, that, and this is the most important thing you can take from my presentation, sales fixes everything. <laughs> okay? So, when you have sales and cash flow, by definition, you're not dead. You still have runway. That's number one. This kind of the Daism, but people forget Daisms. So that's number one. Number two, when you have sales, your investors leave you alone because 90% of their portfolio is imploding. And so they have to go and triage those people. So if you, have, if you invested in 10 companies and one has sales and nine are dying, guess what? You leave that one alone. And you go work on the other nine, and you, know, you tell the CEOs of number eight and number nine, oh, listen, you know, you're a loser, and you're a loser. 
we're going to make you two merge, and we're going to say, oh, it was an acquisition. We're going to declare victory. So we're going to take two plus two and get it to be three. So, so, so I'm telling you, when you have sales, they leave you alone. When you have sales, employee morale is good. When you have sales, you know, you can pay for the free sushi, and you can build the sand volleyball, and buy the foosball, and, you know, the ping pong, and you guys can go have off-sites at the Ritz of Carlton Half Moon Bay. You can do all that bullshit because you have sales. Buy everybody a bicycle, you know, rip off Google, whatever you want. But it's all about sales. And I think, you know, whenever I meet companies and they talk about partnerships, I think it's total bullshit. The reason why you talk about partnerships is because you don't have sales. So always be talking about sales. Sales fixes everything, okay? Nobody ever died by selling too much. Uh, and number 10, is maybe the toughest recommendation of all, which is you have to understand, even though you're the founder, that at some point, if you are not the right person to lead the company or lead the portion of the company, you need to step aside. It is not your company. It is the employees' companies, it's the shareholders' companies, but it's not yours anymore. And so at some point, it may be the right thing to step aside now, this may be you go from CEO to CTO. I'm not saying you should step aside and quit, but at, at some point you have to step back and say, you know, am I the best person in the role? And that is the hardest decision to make. It really takes some soul searching. And then um, number eight, which I duplicated by mistake, uh, I would say that one of my recommendations for you for scaling is Social media. Social media is God's gift to entrepreneurship. And, you know, it's fast, it's free, it's ubiquitous. It, you, you know, you, it is not bound by money. Advertising is bound by money. Marketing is bound by money. But social media is bound by energy. It's bound by insight. It's bound by the ability to do good work, it's not bound by money. And so I think we live in one of the greatest times for entrepreneurs because of social media. And I have to tell you, Jeff Wiener's not in this room anymore, but I would focus on two platforms, LinkedIn and Facebook. Those are the two. Twitter is neither here nor there. Google Plus is neither here nor there. Um, but for, I think for most companies, it is LinkedIn and Facebook. Now, if you're a Fashion company, okay, obviously it is Pinterest and Instagram. But really, if, if, if I were to tell you, you know, if you're only going to focus on two, which two, it'd be LinkedIn and uh, Facebook. Facebook is fantastic. I mean, there's a reason why it's worth so much. And, you know, every day we do targeting like, like my wife, um, I know real estate brokers who target, you know, lives in Silicon Valley, over 40 years old, female. And spends a hundred bucks and, and sends out ads to those. I don't know how else you can do that, something like that. Okay. So Facebook and LinkedIn are the two that are, I think are the best social media platforms. So you've got to get social. That's what that slide should say. Get social. So that's my top 10 tips for scaling. So any questions? The, I think, well, they're all important, but uh, I think if you hire better than yourself, that has ramifications on everything else that you do. Because if you hire better than yourself, if you hire a better salesperson than you are, then that fixes sales, right? Um, and, and, I think that's the key, that it's going to come down to the quality of people. Um, so it should be a source of, of pride that you are not the best person in the company, that you, but you had the insight to hire people better than you. Um, the people who worked for Steve Jobs in the Macintosh division at what they did were better than him. No one was better than him in what he did <laughs> also, but uh, for the functional areas, those people were all better than what he was.
So hire better than yourself. So that's a very rational way of thinking, right? So if you, you, you as an entrepreneur, you start out as a generalist. Yes. And you hire the right people who have been there, done that, and therefore bring that competency right. in a much deeper way. So that's, that's one a, a way of bringing better people. True. Through. Yes. But how about just the caliber of people that uh, have the ability, uh, potentially younger, maybe smarter, yeah. more capable yeah. uh, than yourself? You know, how, how does that work on the mindset of an entrepreneur when they bring in these kinds of people to actually uh, put into their hands the baby that they have created and brought to this point? Well, I guess, you know, what's the alternative? You, you hire someone dumber than you? Uh, so that you can feel better. Uh, you know, seriously, what is the alternative? Um, I, re I really, you know, I wish people would take pride in the fact that they hired people better than themselves. That would be a remarkable thing. Um, the other thing that you talked about was putting in <clears throat> systems. So yeah. I think most of the companies here, you know, as we were talking the other day, they are uh, Series A or mm -hmm. beyond, and therefore they have a point gotten the product market fit, they have initial you know, revenue, they have customers. And at this point, there is this, the, 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 the freedom to innovate, to actually now execute to scale. And, and that they're at that inflection point, and the systems is, is necessary to, to put that uh, in, mm -hmm. you know, path in place. So how do they actually uh, balance the two because there still is the you know space for innovation that they need to create and continue to have while they are also looking for the other part of the organization. The well, well, I think um, I'm a supply driven. So I'm a supply side guy. Okay, so and I mean the supply of innovation and innovative products. So I think the product should always be innovative. And that's what I'm saying about choosing a few battles. So, so if, if the product is always innovative, that's 90% of the action, I would not also suggest that, oh, so we're going to figure out a, a new way of financing this business. So, you know, we're going to create this offshore corporation that's going to go public and, you know, whatever, and then we're going to do this, and we're going to get uh, government grants, and then we're, yeah, like, just, just freaking make great software. I mean, you know, and everything else will work out. Um, I, I think it takes great discipline, uh, and you know, par partially one of the hard things about this is you only know looking back, right? Like it's it's easy to easy to say, okay, yeah, we we did that right or we did that wrong, but at the time, who the hell knew? And for every example of someone making a big mistake, I can point out someone who you know did something that no one thought was right and worked out well. I mean, case in point. When Apple created the first Apple stores, every retail expert in the world said, you are crazy that one company cannot support retail at the kind of prices that, that malls charge. And there's no way that people are just going to walk in, you know. So they go to Abercrombie & Fitch and they buy a shirt and, you know, they go to, uh, they go to Lululemon, they buy some yoga pants and they go buy a $3,000 laptop. You know, that just ain't going to happen. And so every, every expert in retail sales said that <coughs> Apple Store would fail. And obviously it didn't. So now we can say, of course they were successful because they have very loyal following, they have really qualified salespeople, they have the Apple Genius Bar. It's so obvious that this would have worked. <laughs> Not at all. This is the go to the board, say paint the bullseye. Yeah, we knew the Apple Store would work. Mm -hmm. Sure, you knew. Nice to meet you. I'm the founder and CEO of Shareably, and we pre present and create metrics mostly for the enterprise around social media. So I was thrilled to hear you say social. I've watched your Facebook lives. I'm a huge fan. Um, question for you. What do you think are some of the most important metrics for entrepreneurs or small businesses to think about when it comes to um, succeeding on social? What should you, what should the average person... For, for succeeding on social? Um, like how do you know if you're doing it well? Or what do you think is important? Okay, so I'm not a big quant guy. I don't look at my statistics. The only statistics I, honestly, the only statistic I look at is how many more new followers did I get a day? 
Now, you know, you could say that's insipid and shallow thinking and, you know, it's quality, not quantity. But I got to tell you, I mean, I think there are only two kinds of companies and people on social media. Those people like me who want more followers and liars. That's the only two. So I'm not advocating that you buy followers so that you can say you got more followers. That is just cheating and stupid. But for me, that's the thing I look at because I think when the rubber meets the road, either people think you're of, of value to follow or they don't. And they vote with their feet. And so that's the only metric I really care about. I, listen, I know there's all kinds of metrics about engagement and all that. Um, my, my, my approach to social media is what I call the NPR model, or the Wikipedia model. So Wikipedia and NPR, they provide great content. And every once in a while, they run a pledge drive, right? So you turn on the radio, and NPR is saying, we're in the pledge drive, operators are standing by, you know, Microsoft is matching us dollar for dollar, so if you put in $10, Microsoft will put in $10, and then we'll give you the hand crank Eton radio, so that in case there's a nuclear attack, you can crank up the radio, find out when you're going to die. Um, so the reason why those pledge drives work, and I used to be on the board of trustees of Wikipedia. We raise 85 million bucks a year asking for donations with the world's ugliest banners, okay, on the world's ugliest site. And, and the reason why that works is because Wikipedia and NPR provide such value that they have earned the right to promote. So I would say for every one of your startups, you know, you have to earn the right to promote. And so how do you earn the right to promote? You provide value. What is value? Well, value is it's information, it's analysis, or it's entertainment, or it's assistance. It's one of those four things. So, you know, if, if, if I were running a social media analytics company, I would be... I, look at the content that Buffer and Sprout put out. They're always saying, okay, so we did this study and we figured out that, you know, if you, if you do... Live video, it's three times more effective than if you embed YouTube video or, you know, they always have these kind of things that they're constantly providing value and they put out a white paper and all this and then they say, well, you know, per follower you get much more engagement on LinkedIn and it's much more likely that a LinkedIn person is really who he or she, she says he or she is because they're trying to get jobs, they're not all being Lonely Boy 15. So you get all that kind of content, and so you earn the right, and every once in a while I hit them with, okay, so now here's our new product, try it. But you've earned the right to do that. Why is that because Lazy is so the opposite of what big brands do? Because big, because big brands abdicate to stupid agencies who used to be PR and advertising firms. Because believe me, I was inside a big brand and I saw this happen that I would be telling them all this kind of stuff and they would say yeah but our agency back in the Midwest you know who they got like Ariana art history interns assigned to the thing and they're saying that you know we got to do this and we got to do that and they're saying you know they're th saying stuff like you cannot repeat your tweets because when you repeat your tweets you lose followers and people are going to get angry and I said, okay, so you get six people angry a day, but you gain, you know, a thousand. So what's the problem? And, and, I, and I ask them, you know, like, do you, do you TiVo CNN? You know, so, so CNN should run the story once a day because you're going to come home at 8 p.m. and turn on your TiVo or turn on your HDR and go watch what CNN say at 8 a.m.? No, CNN runs the same freaking story 12 times a day. Why is that? Well, it's because not everybody consumes CNN at the same time. Social media is the same thing. So repeat your tweets. No, we cannot do that. And so I think a lot of it is because of abdication. And they're abdicating to people who don't know what they're doing. And, you know, like a very interesting thing is go look at all the agencies and look at how much engagement and followers they have. They're terrible, right? So you, so you, it, it's, I guess the analogy would be, if you went in to see a cardiologist and he or she is smoking and fat and disgusting and wheezing, maybe you shouldn't listen to that cardiologist, you know? That would be my logic. Um, yeah. So what would be your counsel to a, a young startup, unknown brand, facing large incumbents around building brands? 
Well, I mean, obviously it depends on which industry, but social media, man, social media is God's gift to you. I, I don't know how I could say that any stronger. Um, I, it's not only God's gift to you, maybe it's your only path. Unless you, you know, unless you raise 25 million bucks and you know, your investors are saying, yeah, go run a Super Bowl commercial. Unlikely. I think it's social media. I and mean, social media with a, you know, a hundred thousand dollar social media person, you can do a lot of damage. But I'll tell you something. Um, great social media on a lousy product is still putting lipstick on a pig, right? So you, you need to start with a great product and then social media is easy. But if you have a pig, a pig is a pig. It might have lipstick on it, but it's still a pig. So don't get me wrong. Social media is a great tool, but you got to have, you know. How do you, there's so much money. Everyone's making that much noise. No, but everybody's not making that much noise. Oh, everybody's making noise, but they're not adding value. So what, what business are you in? Customer experience. You're in what? Customer experience. Okay, so if I were running social media for you, I would just be curating and creating all kinds of stories about customer, right? I would write a post of like, these are the 10 things that United did wrong. So did you write that? Okay, so, and so you, you put that out, you tweet it three times, you put it on Facebook and LinkedIn, you spend a hundred bucks and you know, you. You try these experiments. I'm not saying I got all the knowledge, okay? But if this United thing is a gold mine for you, if if you wanted to do something more funny, you know, you would do like you would do a, you try to make a video that's like three minutes long, you know, so there was United breaks guitar, so now you know United breaks noses. I mean, you know, there's like a lot of things you can do. Then then the rabbit died on the flight, right? So you can like, you know, United kills rabbits. I mean, we could go a long time with this. And so that's entertainment. You could write a, a, a paper about, so, you know, what would you do if you were the CEO of United going forward? This is what he should do. Probably resign, but I mean, you know. Um, and then the, I just saw an interview of Richard Branson talking about, as Virgin, you know, what he would have done or all that. So you should reshare that video. So basically, I think you want to build a reputation that, you know, when I follow you, it's not about you pimping your product to me all the time. You showed me a video from Richard Branson. You wrote an essay about what United should do. You, you cited a Harvard Business Review about the 10 secrets to customer support. You know, you found an old interview with the CEO of Nordstrom who explains the Nordstrom way, you know, whatever it is. And I, I think those kinds of things are highly likely to be reshared. And so now, the, I, I call it the reshare test. And the way the reshare test works is, Whenever you post something, you should believe that what you're posting is so good that people will reshare it. Not, not that just the first generation will like it, but they will like it so much, they will risk their reputation on it. So to use a restaurant analogy, you know, giving a like or a thumbs up or a plus, that's like tipping the waiter, right? Which is nice, don't get me wrong. But if you go to a restaurant, and then the next day you go in the office and you say, you have got to eat at this restaurant. It is the best sushi, steak, whatever it is, the best. At that point, you're not just giving the waiter the tip. You are risking your reputation. You're telling people you've got to eat at this restaurant. And if they go and it sucks, you suck. So in your mind, if, if you posted a video of Richard Branson explaining what he would do if he were the United CEO, that passes the reshare test, right? So I get it, I follow you, I get it. I said, huh, you know, the people who follow me would find this interesting too. And they reshare it, so they see you, so they say, huh, this guy I really found a good thing, I'll follow him. I think that's how you build up more followers. Okay. So, uh, you spoke about Facebook and LinkedIn, and uh, we've seen uh, a lot of value being unlocked from, from Facebook for B2C companies. Yeah. Uh, but uh, especially about LinkedIn, um, do you see uh, 
like there, there is there is already value but for b2b companies uh, what are the different ways in which you can allow? yeah see i i guess i i think that this question you know since you're saying should b2b companies be on social media right i i think in a few years we're going to look back at that question like today if i said to you if you're selling books online clothing online i understand if you're a restaurant i understand selling surfboards online i understand but i sell bolts i sell titanium airplane parts i sell office furniture for enterprises should i have a website and what would you say no so i think the same thing is going to be true of social media uh, of of b2b it probably is true already my, it's hard for me to imagine if you said to me so guy tell me a company who should not be on social media i would really struggle with that um it 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 would be like say tell me a company that should not have a website you know i mean take an extreme so like i don't know general dynamics right why should General Dynamics have a website? It's not like I was like, why don't I buy an F-18? Like, I've always wanted a fighter plane. I'm going to go buy one, right? Just one click in my basket. <laughs> so why should General Dynamics, I don't know if, I don't, don't get me wrong, I don't know if General Dynamics makes the F-18, but one of those defense contractors makes them. So why should it? Recruiting, you know, maybe, maybe they just want to have a presence so that 600 politicians in Congress are aware of them. Or, you know, maybe so 500 bureaucrats in China are aware of them. I don't know, whatever. But I can't build a case where General Dynamics shouldn't have a website. My question is more on uh, how, how do you think B2B companies can leverage LinkedIn in multiple ways? Any thoughts? Well, LinkedIn certainly for recruiting. I, 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 I wish I was here when Jeff was talking because I have like an epiphany with LinkedIn about a month ago because um, LinkedIn, in my mind, like I think many other people, they believe that LinkedIn is for professional business, networking, <laughs> business development, that kind of stuff, right? But in my humble opinion, having tried a lot of stuff lately, I think LinkedIn is just basically Facebook with authenticated identities. And so, if you looked at my LinkedIn feed, you would be shocked because it's all anti-Trump, surfing, and Mercedes. All three of those, you would probably have said, don't belong on LinkedIn. It should be about business, profession, you know, all that kind of stuff. My, my LinkedIn timeline is the most unprofessional. I, I shared a picture today of me in a wetsuit surfing and the caption was, does this wetsuit make my butt look big? Okay, that's not your typical LinkedIn post. But I'm telling you, it's getting 100,000 views. So now, obviously, I have a cavalier attitude. You know, I'm not sure you should do that or your company should do that. But I'm telling you that I think LinkedIn is a social media platform and that it's going to be a prime source of news as opposed to I need to put my resume up there so that I can get hired. It's way beyond that. But lots of people don't want to make that leap. The irony is, whenever I do surfing Mercedes or anti-Trump, there's always three or four people who say, take it to Facebook, don't post here. And, and then they say, you know, if you don't stop, I'm going to unfollow you. To which I say, go ahead. And, and um, but see, the irony here is that these people are telling me what I'm doing on Facebook is unprofessional. But I think them telling me that I'm being unprofessional and they're going to unfollow me makes them look unprofessional, right? So wh when you go on, on LinkedIn and you say, Guy, you posted about anti-Trump, so I'm unfollowing you. Politics don't belong on LinkedIn. I think that's the equivalent of you're in intermediate or high school and you say in front of the whole school, I'm not going to be your friend anymore. <laughs> like, 
tell me, if you're a recruiter and you see that person tell someone with 20 million followers, I'm not going to follow you anymore, you'd say, that's the kind of employee we want. Mature, good judgment, you know, whatever. Um, so sometimes people from companies like Accenture and Walmart, and they do that to me, and I push back, and I say, so is this, are you saying that Accenture, which holds itself as a thought leader, are you saying that you're recommending to your clients that when they don't like somebody on social media, they should declare that they're unfollowing them? And about 60 minutes later, the comment disappears. Because I think they finally figured out, you know, I am so stupid. I am, right? I mean, I think that's the beauty of LinkedIn, that, that at some point people realize that, hmm, maybe I should not hold up a sign that says I'm an idiot. I should hide that if I am an idiot. So anyway, I don't know how we went down this rat hole. But anyway, uh, I, I don't... So I just, now to me, LinkedIn is the best social media platform. So information, analysis, entertainment, that's what I do. That's what I post. At one point, you were big on Twitter. and that You did a class on Twitter when you were there. But yeah, well. Lo lots of things have changed. I, lots of things have changed. Like, I, I think that Twitter is just, it's too much at this point. I used to love Google Plus, too. Don't get me wrong. But Google Plus, I mean, Google just sort of stopped caring, I think, about Google Plus. And um, so for me, for me, really, it's Facebook and, and LinkedIn. Yes? Any advice on the, any other the marketing activities that could be useful for B2B companies like all of us, for example, like trade shows, um, doing webinars? Um, I, I think all... I'm a little skeptical about trade shows, but video conference and webinar, you know, slam dunk, virtually no cost, right? Uh, if I were a B2B company, would I try doing Facebook Live? Absolutely, I would. You know, B2B company, Facebook Live. What could a B2B company, Facebook Live, do? Uh, we're interviewing one of our key customers, how they use our product. Or we're going to take you behind the scenes to show you how we make the widgets. Or let me, we're going to interview the, the, um, the product manager of the product or the engineer of the product. Uh, I think you should be going Facebook Live all the time. And listen, all this stuff that I tell you could be all wrong, but I just tell you, just suspend disbelief and try it. Just try Facebook Live. And then tell me it sucked and it didn't work. Okay, I understand that. But don't think that, oh, Facebook is Trixie and Biff showing that they're naked and drunk, so it has no place for B2B. I would debate that. I would debate that all day long. Um, try it. Just try it. What else? Okay, I cannot understand Snapchat to save my life. I just... I, I am not the target. I just, I have tried it. I just, I don't know. Only because we're over 30, right? Yeah, I, over 60. Um, I say that. Well, but, so I, I, you know, maybe, I, I don't know if I would use Snapchat to sell social media analytics. We're going to like put, you know, dog ears on her. I mean, I don't know, you know. Um, uh, Snapchat, I punt. I cannot tell you what to do with Snapchat. I don't know. Although, you know, with Instagram stories, I mean, Instagram is like Snapchat for the rest of us, right? At least I can, I can understand what's happening with Instagram. Um, yeah, I think something really negative posted. Like, you as a person may be different. As a B2B brand, if you do take a... We, we also have a fairly active social... Yeah channel open for me yeah. and for the company. Yeah. What do you do? It's not happened yet, but what do you think, what do you do when someone really comes in and says something really negative? Like, and says, I tried your product, it didn't work and it's really social, right? It's there, it's out there. What yeah. You mean so someone rips you and says your product is crappy, buggy, whatever, you know, whatever? I I would um I would respond 
and I would say, you know, I apologize for your experience. Here's my cell phone. Here's my email. Let's take it offline so I can get more information and try to solve your problem. And that is, I mean, my thinking would be on two levels. One is I don't want my dirty laundry washed <laughs> in front of everybody. And I also don't want to appear like I'm threatened or he's right. <laughs> So I think you, you know, this is, you take the high road and you say, you know, this should have never happened. You could, don't use the word reaccommodate. That, that's not going to work anymore. You know, we'd like to, re yeah, we'd like to reaccommodate your uh, seat. Um, and I would, I would try to take it offline. Uh, you know, I don't think most people are looking for a fight. And, uh, I, it, it, along the lines of baking, not eating, I think you should always take the high road and assume people are good until proven bad at least twice. One time could just be a mistake and, you know, whatever. The second time is, I, I, I have a theory, the Guy Kawasaki theory of perfect knowledge of assholes. And I... This is how it works. So there have been many times where I thought someone was an asshole. And when I was young, I used to think, well, you think he's an asshole. You had a bad interaction. You had a bad day or whatever. You know, probably most people don't think he's an asshole. This is going to conflict what I just said about giving people chance twice. But then my observation is that if you think someone's an asshole, pretty much everybody thinks that person is an asshole. Very seldom have I met an asshole that I ask other people and they say, he's a terrific guy. So there's perfect information about assholes. So um, I think one of the, so, so one is to like, let's take it offline. And then the second thing, which really works, is when somebody rips you like that, ask them, have you used the product? Because I promise you, I think about 90% of the time, they're going to say, no, I haven't, but I saw this on Usenet that, you know, you're buggy and, you know, crappy and slow and not secure. And so they haven't used the product. They're quasi-trolling you. They're being an asshole. And you're just asking a very neutral question. Have you used the product? So if, you know, if, if, if I were Elon Musk and somebody says, you know, your, your S-Class is a piece of shit, the brakes don't worry or whatever, you say, do you own one? Oh, no, I just read someplace that, you know, like, okay, asshole. I mean, you know, ask somebody. That's, maybe that's the first step. Ask them, do you actually use, did you actually use the product? Because uh, they may just be trying to get a rise out of you. So, what else? When you're a startup and you're investing a lot of your time and yeah. effort into yeah. doing something, at least, in some sense, it can be a little counterintuitive, right? Because it's your time, which is a major investment in, in doing something. Yeah. So, is it, does it always work, or you know, are there some ex exceptions? Wait, wait, what does that have to do with going slow? So, essentially, going slow means you, you are spending more time of your limited time. No, no, I, uh, what, what I'm talking about going slow is basically how fast you increase your burn rate. So, you know, there's a theory that you, you, you prepare for growth and, you know, you build in the infrastructure and you put in systems and you do all this kind of stuff. But I have to say, you know, time and time, I've seen this situation. Now, it may be for companies younger than you, but time and time I've seen the situation where it sort of goes like this. So the company gets funded, CEO comes back and says, we just got funded. I really like these venture capitalists. They really, they get it. They understand my vision. And they're investing, they told me, they're investing in people. People. <laughs> it's not the product, it's not the market, it's they believe in us. They invested in people, I really like. Unlike all the other asshole VCs, this guy, this gal, believes, okay? That's the first board meeting. <laughs> so what comes next? So now the rock star programmer that you hired, 
from Craigslist. Not so rock star. Misses the shipment full of bugs. So you go back to the next board meeting and you say, I told you we'd ship now. I was wrong. You know, whatever. But we're in beta now. And the beta sites love it. That's a whole other subject. Beta sites always love what you give them because, frankly, it takes a real asshole to tell you your product sucks. It's like saying, do you like my baby? Who the hell ever says, oh, you have an ugly baby? But you know they're ugly babies, right? Okay, so anyway, so second meeting is, well, we're late. But this time, my rock star programmer said, they're going to do it. And we are so confident because of all the positive feedback we'd have from our beta sites. We think we need to increase our infrastructure. We need more support. We need field service. We need systems engineers because, man, when we turn the switch, my God, you know, we're going to go to infinite, infinity and beyond. The VC is like looking up from his phone and say, okay. So you do that. Another six months go by. I had to fire that rock star programmer. Come to find out his architecture was shit, couldn't scale, you know, whatever. So now, and then we had this, we had this big discussion like, should we try to, put band-aids on this sinking ship or should we rewrite from scratch? And we decided, because we're the visionaries that we are, we need to rewrite it from scratch. That's the right thing to do. So meanwhile, you, you, know, you got this fifty hundred thousand dollars in overhead because you were going to ship and all that, right? And so the next board meeting is, <laughs> you know, that's, they give you like one more shot and then the next board meeting is like, you know, every Monday for 84 weeks, I've been telling my partners, this is a world-class team and a great market with a patent-pending, curve-jumping, enterprise, scalable technology. And I got to tell you, they're tired of hearing that. And I'm tired of saying that. So we got this other loser company in our portfolio in a similar market. We're going to make you two guys merge. We're going <laughs> to declare victory. And the CEO goes back to his team and says, can I swear? Because this is how it goes. This is like, I just got fucked by our board. <laughs> like, they told me, you heard them say that they invest in people. You heard that, right? And you heard them say that they believe in me. Well, that was 18 months ago, right? And so now they just threw me out under the bus. So this is Pied Piper, right, in Silicon Valley, right? This is Pied Piper. And he just threw me on, I can't believe it. They told me they invested in people. And that's what happens. And so, you know, that's kind of predictable. So the key is don't have a run rate, don't have a burn rate of 100,000 a month when you have zero sales. I mean, <laughs> duh. And then the flip side of that is, like I said before, Sales fixes everything. <laughs> so if you just had sales, you would not have this problem. Nobody would be bugging you. You could have foosball tables all over the place. You can have off sites. You can go to, you know, opening night of Hamilton, take the guys to the San Francisco Giants baseball. I don't care what you do. Sales fixes everything. <sighs> so, you know, I don't know. <laughs> That's a long answer to your question. What else? One last question. You probably not. You guys like saying, "Why did we bring Guy in, man? What a downer conversation." We <laughs> do, you see, do you see a difference in Europe and the states in terms of trends and companies? And Honestly, um, I'm not an expert in in that kind of thing. When I travel around the world, my observation is that entrepreneurs are more similar than they're different. And I, I think you know if you if you control for if I didn't know where I was and there were no visual cues, accents, and stuff like that, honestly, I, it's very hard to tell where you are. It's not like entrepreneurs in Europe say a very different thing than entrepreneurs in China and all that. It, not, not my experience, anyway. I think people in this room, you're probably more similar than you are different. Um, it, 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 yeah, I, that's been my experience. I, I, uh, <laughs> I can, I've met entrepreneurs like you all over the world, and you all, you all want to change the world. You're all, you know, at the prime of your life. 
I used to be there once, but. <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, I think you're in a great time, man. And um, Probably the biggest risk for you is Donald Trump. Really, I truly do believe that. You may not, I, I don't know where everybody is politically, but uh, I literally think he could end the world. I mean, I just, like I wake up every morning and say, thank you, God, we didn't attack North Korea. Another day is good, you know? And um, so I think that's that's something to keep in mind. And And so I've never said that before that, you know, the political situation could affect entrepreneurship so much. I used to tell people you should ignore who the president is. Because if you believe Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump is going to make a difference in your, you know, 15 person startup, like how does it go from, you know, who's president down to it caused you to fail? Probably it's because you hired a lousy programmer much more than it's Donald Trump. But I'm not sure that's true anymore. Um, because he really could ruin industries. So, uh, but you, you know, in a sense, you can't do anything like that about that, right? So, I think the entrepreneur attitude is, you know, if, if you're an entrepreneur and you're waiting for the perfect time where you have the perfect team in the perfect market with no competition, you're not an entrepreneur. I mean, that's the bottom line. Because anybody can start a company when there's no competition, great market, and great technology. It takes someone with real courage to start it when, you know, it's this team you're putting together with duct tape and it's te technology with duct tape and it's unproven market. But I got to say, you know, if you look at the history of great companies, great tech companies, it's hard to make the case. Well, this, w when you watch venture capitalists talk, they're always saying we want team, technology, and market, right? They always say those three things. But then if you, were to, if you were to test Microsoft, Yahoo, in, Pinterest, Instagram, Uber, I mean, just all the successful companies you heard of, if you were to really say, okay, so did any of these companies have a great team in a great and proven market with great and proven technology? Zero. Zero, right? Every one of them is unproven team, unproven technology, unproven market. And that's why entrepreneurship is so hard. And so, you know, after the fact, you can say, yeah, I knew Steve Jobs was a great person and a great entrepreneur. I knew that Bill Gates, I knew that, you know, Jeff Wayne, I know Reed Hastings, I knew, you know, I knew that. Uh, they were great, but really, at the time you had to squeeze the trigger 20, 25 years ago, you had no idea. There's nobody. It's only retroactively. Um, so, you know, the bottom line is, man, you you take your shot and you you work like hell and you hope you get lucky. I mean, I, I really think so. I, the the older I get, the more I think it's better to be lucky than smart. Um, it really, <laughs> so now, so, you know, what does that translate for you? I, I think, well, so the key lessons I would say is hire better than yourself. So, so I can only give you things that I think will increase the probability of your success. I can't tell you how guaranteed it, because if I could guarantee it, <laughs> I wouldn't tell you. I would keep this as a secret. So I think that um, hiring people better than yourself, embracing social media, it's the best kind of free marketing you could get. Uh, I think another good thing I'd like to tell you is you should never ask people to do something that you would not do. So if you won't do it, don't ask people to do it. At a very simplistic level, if you hate CAPTCHA, don't put CAPTCHA on your website, right? Because if you hate CAPTCHA, guess what? Probably everybody hates CAPTCHA, so why? You know, what's the purpose of CAPTCHA? Reduce the number of customers, right? So. Um, and you know, if like to use that same test internally, if you're sitting in Silicon Valley, but your programmers are in Bangalore, so what? When you fly to Bangalore, you fly first class, and when the programmers fly here, they fly coach. So you're asking your programmers to fly coach, but you fly business or first. That's wrong. If they're flying coach, you fly coach. If they're flying first, you fly first too. Don't get me wrong. Um, it's that kind of thing. 
And uh, I think those, those three things, if you did that, that's, that's as sweet as you could put yourself in that spot. Um, i got to tell you one more story. I got, I don't, are you guys, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know if they need the office, you know, they need this room. <laughs> um, i got to finish with this story, and it's a story that's it's pivotal in my life. So there used to be, an, I, this is the ice story. So ice 1.0 was you harvested ice in the winter. You use a saw, sleigh, and a horse. This is 1900. 30 years later, there's ice factory. You freeze water centrally, ice man delivers ice in the ice truck. 30 more years later, refrigerator. Now you have your personal ice factory. Ice man doesn't deliver ice to your house, you just go to your refrigerator. Ice harvesting, ice factory, and refrigerator all did the same thing, cleanliness and convenience. But the mechanism by which they delivered it got better. Cutting blocks of ice, freezing water centrally, refrigerator. And yet, you, you would think that, oh, smart business people would say, huh, I'm an ice harvester, but a factory's better. I'm going to get on the factory curve. Then you own the ice factory. You say, hmm, refrigerator's better. I'm going to get on the refrigerator curve. But the truth is, not one company went from harvester to factory to refrigerator because most companies define themselves in terms of what they already do. So if you define yourself as we take chemicals, we put it on plastic film, that plastic film is exposed to light, we get the plastic film back, we expose it to different chemicals, and we produce photographs, then guess what? You might not embrace digital photography. And if you are, are tapping signals through a telegraph, you might not embrace telephones. And if you have copper-based telephones, you might not embrace VoIP. And so nobody in this room probably uses a Kodak camera or a Polaroid camera or a Smith Corona computer or a Wang word processor or a Remington RAN. You got to get to the next curve. And so the next curve is where the innovation is, it's where the meaning is made, it's where the margin is, it's where all the action is. So hopefully your first product has jumped to the next curve or created the next curve. But then, you know, just remember as you scale that, you know, do you want to be the most successful ice factory in the world when everybody else is using refrigerators? <laughs> That's the test. Okay? So pardon my profanity, but, you know, I, have you, okay, do you guys watch Silicon Valley? Okay, that, the, re the reason why it's funny is because it's true. I mean, that, you have, that should be required viewing. Now, obviously, it's kind of exaggerated, but not too much. Man. I mean, not too much. That is a great series. Yeah. So you, if you want insights into tech startups, watch Silicon Valley on HBO. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, one more. Hey guys, I love the pre-share test that you mentioned. Uh, so the question is, you know, to me, there's very sort of classic word of mouth marketing in itself, that someone's willing to sort of put the reputation on the line, yes. say something about you. Yes. And That's evangelism. So, what, 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 in your, how would you sort of describe what is it that makes people do that? What oh, okay. Okay. So, um, that's called evangelism. And evangelism comes from the Greek words of bringing the good news. So that's what, that's what evangelism means. So the difference between evangelism and most traditional sales is the traditional salesperson has his or her best interests. I want you to buy Macintosh because I got my you know, monthly quota, and if I meet quota, I get bonus. That's not evangelism. Evangelism is you make graphics, I have a better way for you to make graphics. You should use Canva. Or 30 years ago, you should use Macintosh. Now, don't get me wrong. If you use Canva or Macintosh, it's good for me. I work for Apple, right? But really, the reason why I'm telling you to use Canva or Macintosh back then is because it's good for you. It's going to make you more creative and productive. And so if your product passes this test, you'll get evangelists. So... Um, 
this is a Garmin Phoenix watch. I, I don't have any, you know, ties with this, although they, they, this is a, you know, evaluation unit, so I didn't pay for it, but they're not paying me to tell you this is a really great watch, right? Mercedes-Benz brand ambassador, I'm paid for that, so you have to suspect what I'm doing. But, you know, when I tell people, this is a, this bag, I'm really into bags. I buy bags all the time. So this is a bag made by Peak Design. It's really well designed. It's a great place for a laptop. You can shove everything in here. I mean, I can show you this is my power supply. This is my tripod. This is all the shit you have to carry, you know, when you have like all the adapters when you're a Macintosh owner. This is a, this is an extra pair of pants because you just never know. And this is, you know, and like, it goes on and like, this is an orange to eat. And then, you know, this is my, my laptop's over here, my notebook's over here. I carry a lot of cash because you never know, I may be going through some country someday, I gotta pay somebody off and I'm gonna pay them off. I'm gonna get the hell out of that country. So I, here like I got multiple passports, I got all this. This is a great bag. I'm telling you, this is a great bag. I love this bag. Now, I'm not being paid to tell you to buy this Peak Design bag. This bag is good news. That's evangelism. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I hope you don't get fired. <laughs> I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll make Robbie's review later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now let me put my. Remember to send a check to Peak. Yeah. Bill. Bill. Guy, thank you very much for it's making the time. My pleasure. You know, can I tell you a great joke? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, this is a story that always works. I'm going to preface you with that. So, you know, there is a little like irony that I'm speaking to Microsoft because I spent much of my career trying to defeat this company at Apple. And uh, so, whenever I speak at Microsoft, I was going to do it today, but I thought, you know, I don't know. So the way the story works is, so I told my wife this morning that I'm going to speak to Microsoft on the Microsoft campus. And so, honey, in your wildest dreams, did you ever think that I would be a keynote speaker for Microsoft? And you know what my wife said? She said, honey, you're not in my wildest dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>